So this is a special edition of Diet Soap. Um, we've got Spencer Leonard and Cyber Dandy here with us today to discuss Bakunin and uh, Marx. And uh, it's it's Marxism versus anarchism today. We'll see who the winner is. No, no, no. It's a discussion to try to you know explain and understand um, the the history of the uh, First International and the split between anarchism and Marxism, maybe. Right. So, the, so Doug, the way that we prepared, you said you didn't even know the text that we were <laughs> talking about. I mean, it, it's statism and anarchy, and, and it's, a, it's a monster sort of sprawling thing. I'm not sure if Bakunin published it in his own lifetime. I, I just struggled to, to get through it um, you know, to, by way of preparation. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's the 1873 version of a kind of mounting, uh, divergence or, or debate or critique between, um, between Marx and Bakunin that's, that's taking place in the context of the, of the first international or the international working man's association specifically this text is coming right after the the hague congress which is uh w which was sort of the controversial one uh or the one that um i th i think involved expelling the bakunists if i'm not mistaken and transferring the international to New York, uh, which was effectively to put it in mothballs as far as, you know, Europe, the European uh, socialists were concerned. And, and, and those things, of course, were both done, um, you know, with the active involvement of, of Marx and Engels. And so this text is, is Bakunin's, uh, you know, one of his, you know, he's, he's actually quite prolific in, uh, after you know, once he enters into this so-called anarchist phase, which is all I think we're going to talk about um, of, of his life. Um, so I'm going to try to give a very sort of sympathetic uh, treatment of Bakunin or to at least try to identify like what it is that he's getting at, like why it's important, um, you know, to, to kind of take it on. And so uh, if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to read a bit of what I prepared. Uh, Bakunin, of course, is an anarchist, and the question is, what does that amount to? And one of the ways that I'd want to frame that is in terms of how Bakunin is true to the legacy of liberalism, uh, a, a legacy that Marx also participates in. Uh, for Bakunin, <clears throat> the state the capital state, especially the state as it's emerging uh, in the second half of the 20th, 19th century, however adequate his account of that is or not, is an imposition of private property. It's an imposition by the ruling class of its class power. So that Bakunin understands capitalism in specifically political terms. And it's in that context that I would say that Bakunin is a critic of the great innovation beyond liberalism of the 19th century, uh, namely democracy. Uh, his criticism of Marx is as a Democrat, because for Bakunin to play in the arena of the state is already to concede to capitalism. Bakunin's critique of democracy is that it precludes social transformation. Given that capitalism is a matter of class and class is a function of private property, Bakunin seeks to carve out a domain separate from private property within society. He opposes the political orientation of Marx, seeking instead to organize independently of the state. Of course, the working class does have to organize itself in civil society. Uh, and socialists did 
certainly social democracy did in the period following this under Bismarck of the anti-socialist laws when uh, socialism was illegal in Germany. Uh, and just an aside, we might say that you know there's a great deal of contemporary significance to this now in that um, you know the organizing that needs to be done uh, in our world uh, we might view as anarchist uh, in that there would be very little Marxist about it and it needs to begin in civil society. Bakunin's anarchism is more up to date than Proudhon's, though he is certainly a Proudhonian. Uh, he, they both view the realm of freedom in terms of the of self organization of society, and from a Marxist point of view, ignore the problem of the capitalist state, or as I say, view it as an imposition. For anarchists, the state represents an illegitimate usurpation of authority and from which stems private property. What should belong to society as a whole has been wrested away from it by the state. Contra Marx, as an advocate for national workers' parties, contra Marx's social democracy, Bakunin upholds the fact that the working class has no country. Society is not national, but international. The only thing that is national or the ground of nationalism is the private property of the bourgeoisie. This is why Bakunin criticizes Marx and Engels as nationalists, because for him, to the degree that one gives into the state by acting politically within it, one gives into capitalism and to nationalism. Bakunin is a proponent of the Slavs precisely for the reason that Marx and Engels oppose them as non-historic peoples. Uh, the same goes for the peasants and the lumpen proletariat, uh, both of whom I would argue Bakunin neglects in their role as constituents of Bonapartism. Bakunin doesn't like Marx's anti lumpenism. In this, he differs from Proudhon's petty bourgeois sympathies. Marx and Engels, by contrast, favor the town over the country, the developed countries over the undeveloped. For Bakunin, the poor have the least stake in the existing system, whereas he thinks Marx and Engels are oriented to the workers who do have a stake in the bourgeois order, to those workers who do have a stake in the bourgeois order. Thus, for Marxists, the issue might become, say, that of a labor bureaucracy uh, as opposed to simply those who enjoy a higher standard of living or might be literate, uh, etc. The What is often abused is the so-called labor aristocracy. But Bakunin wouldn't make that distinction. Bakunin defends the right of the people against the rights of private property, against the rights of the nation state, uh, with its orientation towards universal suffrage and forming political parties for him the social democratic workers' movement concedes to the bourgeoisie and thus threatens to reproduce capitalism through the form of the state. That's enough maybe to kind of uh, get it going. But I wanted to emphasize the way that uh, Bakunin is, as it were, defending in a, in a kind of a deeply liberal way society as the ground of freedom and mm -hmm. society as the ground of internationalism. And that there's something yeah, I, to his critique of, of you know, of, of, of politics, of, of, of Marxian politics, especially in the light of the 20th century. That's, an, that's enough for me. Did you want to respond, Jared? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a few things within that to respond to. I think generally it's worth to note, like, where Proudhon differs from Bakunin or vice versa, which is, Proudhon was much more of an idealist, and Bakunin accepts that critique that Marx made and uh, uses it himself. And Bakunin is more of a naturalist, meaning he really looked up to Darwin and has this sort of naturalistic orientation of seeing human beings as part of the animal world and 
distinguished by their reason, but not necessarily separated from it because of that. So he's a he's a materialist in that sense. And where he differs from Marx in this regard is he he accepts historical materialism, but he sees it as a partial articulation of a a bigger naturalistic uh, development that would be more Darwinian. <clears throat> um, so that's oh, very different from Proudhon, who you have like reason is sort of this geist in history, and the social genius and all that. Um, another thing with Bakunin, as far as the economics goes, I, I agree with Spencer. Property is really important and the state's really important. And different from Marx, I don't think you see a lot of emphasis on the mode of production or the means of production as a driving force in history. It, my impression is that Bakunin thinks it in like very nationalist terms, even though he opposes like political nationalism as a divisive force, he still basically is looking at the world as a collection of nations or nationalities, <clears throat> which I thought was pretty surprising. Um, and when you're reading statism and anarchy, it's incredible how, how important that sort of nationalistic outlook is to what he's saying about Marx and what he's saying about Germany and pan-Germanism and Slavism and all these things. And he believes in national character types and even attributes authoritarianism to a German kind of character type. And this is something I think is pretty uh, annoying, um, to say the least, because it's really I tried not to ignore all that, I admit. except for my comments about the Slavs. Huh? Say that again? I, I tried to ignore the, you know, what really amounts to a kind of race thinking, uh, except with respect to the Slavs, to try to, to point out that there is like a political point to the way he thinks about it. Right, he has these, you know, for him, Germany is sort of forever and always becoming Bismarckian imperialism. Yep. Right. Um, and the Slavs are, you know, forever stateless. <laughs> yeah. It's um, really, you know, czarism notwithstanding. Right. Which he spends a decent amount of time trying to distinguish, like, the Russian imperial, you know, the Russian empire from the Slavic people and all these categories he uses and the reason that i focus on it is because i he really seems to see the state as like a uh well one of his critiques is that if a state tries to unify different nationalities it's going to result in utter disaster and so he makes like almost this racist argument against the state that's one thing he did in that book which i found bizarre the other thing about the state is he sees it mostly as always existing within the context of competition with other states. And I think this is something that uh, is fundamental to the way that he looks at the state because he attributes um, interests, national interests maybe, but at least like a universal kind of statist interest to these institutions. They always need to expand they're always in competition with one another and uh, of necessity, they always need to subordinate the population to its interests. And this is something that he just repeats over and over again. And you don't, um, it's not even rooted in economics. I don't think it comes from a different place. So I think with those things, you know, uh, his critique of Marx is basically like he does accuse Marx as sort of being like Bismarck in a way. Um, but he'll say like Bismarck was a junker, whereas Marx is a Republican and a, a socialist. Right. But he sees Marx as sort of having the same German project of uh, uh, trying to impose this sort of pan Germanic patriotism not only on the first international, but on Europe in general. And he's very paranoid about this and he tries to defend it from like a pan Slavic perspective. I think that this is one of the most interesting parts about it. 
Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, um, but I mean, like I said, so it's, it, I mean, we framed it with respect to like sort of the internal history of the international, but of course what's happening uh, in European history in 1873 is it, it's in the immediate um, aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War. And therefore, you know, Bismarck has, um, you know, cr- gotten his emperor crowned in Versailles, right? He had conquered France and withdrawn, in effect, um, you know, with... You know, you know, not to mention the, the the episode that is known as the Paris Commune that 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 sort of was at the end of that. Uh, even though the Germans weren't directly involved, except to sort of allow French troops into the city to subjugate it, they didn't do it themselves. Uh, nevertheless, German militarism and or, or Prussian militarism. German nationalism um, now lies at the heart of what he calls the New Holy Alliance, uh, which is to say that Germany has now taken the position of managing European affairs for effectively a British-dominated world. You know, a, 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 it, within sort of Pax Britannica, the the lieutenancy has shifted from from Paris to Berlin, and for Marx, uh, well, for for Bakunin, uh, the the working class threatens to be the basis of that Bismarckian state, um, and and this. In the Lasallian um, social democrats are big supporters of the Franco-Prussian War. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say big supporters, but you know, the war, of course, is initiated by French aggression, and they are their response is more or less um, uncritically patriotic. That's not true of of Marxist supporters, and I think that Bakunin is simply unfair uh, or ignorant of what uh, history would know as the Eisenachers, uh, you know, that uh, wing of social democracy that's being organized uh, in southern Germany by uh, Wilhelm Liebknecht and August Babel. Um, you know that eventually will will fuse with the Lasallians in 1875 at Gotha, um, prompting you know Marx's famous critique of their program, uh, which I, I think we might want to discuss um, as, as a really fundamental uh, dimension to uh, Marx's response to Bakunin, or what we might call Marx's anarchism. Um, and and so it's in that context that Bakunin is seeing the working class as you know, in essentially democratizing this German imperialism, you know, demanding universal suffrage, and in developing uh, you know party politics within this Bismarckian imperial formation uh, that that Bakunin is is. You know, leveling his critique, uh, and and what does it really mean uh, for the working class to participate or to democratize the state, to participate within the capitalist state, or to democratize the state? I mean, I, I mean, I feel like I'm defending Bakunin more than you, than you are, um, you know, because there's a lot that's I, th- you know, I think it's hard to defend in Bakunin, you know, but there's also a reason why. Uh, you know, he is so important uh, for anarchism. Um, it, yeah. I've noticed lately that as I've tried to champion free speech and the rights of civil society above the state, um, some people are unclear as just to just what civil society is. 
you know, what yeah. is civil society? What is society? And listening to you um, both, it seems as though there is a different understanding of just what society or civil society might be uh, that Bakunin holds as opposed to Marx or vice versa, that they have different conceptions. I wonder if one of the distinctions between them might be just exactly what uh, Cyber Dandy said, which is that um, Bakunin has a naturalistic understanding of society, not just of the individual in it, but um, not just of, of the human being, but of human society as something that is evolving um, organically. Um, uh, and whereas Marx understands uh, society as through, you know, a political economic critique of it uh, that that would place capitalism within civil society, within society and not within the state. So that's my question. I'm not sure if it's helpful or not, but I'll let you guys pick it up. Uh, I mean, I think the the observation that people have trouble conceptualizing civil society today is valid. I mean, I, at least, you know, probably what you're encountering and people responding to your, uh, your advocacy of free speech and whatnot. But um, I don't know how much that difference plays into the difference between Marx and Bakunin. And I didn't mention this earlier, but I should have, but a huge part of what Bakunin is trying to work out or fight against is the history of religion. And this is less of uh, something he talks about in statism and anarchy, which is why I'm trying to avoid it a little bit. But it is a huge part of his overall viewpoint that what legitimates the state is ultimately metaphysics, or it's some sort of either coming straight from the church and papal authority, or through a in the way that Feuerbach looks at the inversion of God and humanity, Bakunin kind of applies that same uh, inversion to the legitimacy of the state, where the state is sort of this alienated human power, but it's a political alienation instead of a spiritual one. And that that is a uh, I don't I don't I've never read Marx's critique of Feuerbach, so I don't know where what Marx would have to say about that. But um, Bakunin definitely sees the state as a secularized or, you know, a democratic state as a secularized uh, theological entity. Spencer, did you? Sure. I mean, I would I would say that, um, you know, Bak Bakunin's, a, you know, the older man uh, by, I think, uh, four or five years. And, you know, but, but his, his intellectual formation uh, is remarkably similar to Marx's. Uh, you know, Marx, you know, fell in love with the Enlightenment tradition and the French Revolutionary tradition. Uh, remark, you know, strangely, uh, in part, you know, certainly from his own father, uh, but also from what would become his father-in-law, uh, his future wife, Jenny's aristocratic father. And Bakunin uh, was a, a son of the aristocracy in, in Russia. And in his family, they cultivated, you know, the, um, you know, the, the intellectual traditions and, and, and literature of France, no less surely. And, you know, a lot of Republican ideas and radical ideas were commonplace within his own house from his own father, uh, who, I, as I'm not mistaken, was, was his only tutor, um, you know, until he was 13 or 14 years old. And, and then later, um, after, Bakunin drops out of sort of Russian military training. Uh, he moves first to Moscow and then to uh, to Germany, effectively to study Hegelian philosophy. Um, and and 
writes on it, uh, I believe translates um, Hegel into Russian. Uh, and, and of course, Marx was a, a great student of Hegelian philosophy, and, and they were both in those young Hegelian circles. Uh, and so, you know, and of course, the deeper critique of of religion, or not, I wouldn't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd call it critique, but um, you know, the the Hegelian account of religion is that it is an expression of the alienation of human freedom, um, right? So that you know, Christianity is both an exp- that expression, right? That we we worship our human freedom. And capacity for self transformation, the overcoming of of the life of you know the flesh through the spirit, uh, the the spiritual self transformation of ourselves. We worship that as some sort of outside being until the Enlightenment, right? Um, you know, for Hegel, which of course he, you know Hegel calls the Enlightenment Christianity. Um, but what he means by that is is something entirely secular, um, right? It, he means a, a radical. He means that the Enlightenment is the continuation of the Reformation. Uh, it, is what he means by that. Um, and in that sense, he's you know giving what you know the account or is the embodiment of what Nietzsche calls you know the killing of God in Europe. Um, you know that that Christianity is sort of the self abolishing religion. So, what I would, how I would tie that to the question of civil society is that um, with the emergence, you know, with, with the emergence of bourgeois social relations in say the 16th century onward. Right, you get this domain of independent human freedom that is recognized as being separate from uh, the church legitimized uh, and state order. Right, you get the emergence of the independence of the third estate, um, and and civil society is just the English for for bourgeois society. People think when you say bourgeois society, you're saying something Marxist and when you say civil society, you're not. It's just Bürgerliche Gesellschaft is the German for civil society, um, which it means the same thing. It means urban, right? Urban society, because that's where it first develops. But uh, it's a it's the domain of freedom where we're neither obeying or disobeying the law, right? Or you might say we're. Uh, what we're doing is 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 lawful, uh, or or neither lawful nor unlawful, uh, in the sense that uh, we are either doing things as they've been done in the past, or we're doing things in a new way uh, that we don't even fully recognize. Uh, but we are acting as individuals, serving our own needs. And yet, doing so through our sociable, peaceful, peaceable relations with others, um, you know, whether that be you know through through marriage, uh, through wider family bonds, through commerce, uh, through friendly competition, uh, through individual achievement, through science, through you know whatever it may be, right. Um, it's the domain of society uh, that is where change is, right? So that's what I'm talking about. That's why I talk about how new things develop there, new forms of being sociable, new new practices, uh, new labor practices, new mo- you know new new productive practices, new needs arise. Um, you know, there is it's the domain, in other words, of, of history. Um, and, and that is for liberals, you know, especially as they grow self-conscious for people like Hegel, uh, it is conquering the state, the state as a kind of a, 
viewed as a kind of an occupying force, say, you know, French speaking aristocrats holding English speaking peasants, um, you know, down under their boot heel, right? Or, or German aristocrats holding, you know, the, the Gaul, the Gaulish, uh, you know, commoners down or, or, or whatever, right? These, these, these states that emerge from military conquest, um, and subordination, uh, they are gradually through uh, long historical processes rendered answerable to, responsible to, ultimately subordinate to society. You know, so that's why things like the emergence of parliament is important, right? All, all of these things, right? The long history of bourgeois revolution is a history of the subjugation of the state to the needs of society. Um, and the aspiration is from liberals that the coercion of human beings by other human beings will no longer be required in the future. Um, and that there will be no ruler, uh, that there will be in that sense anarchy, which is what, that's what anarchy means, is, is that there's no ruler, um, no master no one who's first, right? And I would say that that aspiration is profoundly liberal, profoundly. It's, it's there in Thomas Jefferson. It's there in the founding fathers. It's there in Kant. It's there in Hegel. It's, it's everywhere. It is the enlightenment. It's the political project of the enlightenment uh, that, that, that mankind will become spontaneously sociable, in such a way that it no longer requires uh, the use of force, whether you know police or or war, uh, for it to conduct its affairs one with another, right? And that's why you know, and in, 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 in any description of socialism, it's just this liberal project. <laughs> Right. What, you know, what is when Marx says, you know, what will we have when we get to communism? He says that the freedom of each will be the precondition for the freedom of all. So what he means is that we will each spontaneously freely develop our individuality in a way that reinforces the capa the freedom of all, which is the, the freedom of society to change in such a way that all of our capacities are given greater scope in the future. Right, that's um, you know, the the image that 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 uh, I think you know. That's why it's called socialism. Uh, right, uh, is that it, it would be the completion of that project of of the subordination of society, and and so Bakunin is is taking up that critique of the state, right. Again, like leaving aside all the weird, I mean, the anti-Semitism and the weird race thinking and all the rest, like what's kind of underlying it, right, uh, is this, um, you know, in, in, as a, you know, why is he a great critic of Marx uh, or of Marxism is because uh, the Marxian-led socialist project gave rise to state capitalism, Right, that's the bottom line. Like, that's why anarchism comes back in the 20th century, in a big way. Right, is that uh, the Marxian-led social, you know, project of combined social and political action, uh, but for Bakunin, fatally political action, has meant the erection of a worker state. Uh, what I would really like to underline in Bakunin's critique of a specifically socialist or Marxian state from his perspective is one that basically monopolizes knowledge uh, through setting its, uh, its administrators up as the, the people who know science the best, who are able to and by science, he means sociology, who are able to uh, understand the development of history or the economic forces or whatever you might want to say are the important components well enough to 
coerce society into taking the right path. And this, I think, is the the criticism that's really been influential on anarchists today is to look at this sort of like scientific, ju- scientifically justified elitism as a very dangerous and ultimately authoritarian uh, project. And uh, especially with like some of the anti-civ or primitivist or green type of anarchists, you see this developed, you know, to the point of saying all of civilization is basically that problem. But you even have it in Bakun in his uh, his criticism of Marx that um, once you set up this sort of vanguard, this uh, intellectual vanguard that takes control of the state, it's ultimately going to reinforce its own power and keep the masses ignorant and uh, prevent and the actual um, liquidation of itself into society or its functions into society. And, you know, and, and today, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to defend Marx eventually. Um, but, you know, it, it's worth pointing out that the, um, domination that workers experience does take the form of power, right? It is, it isn't just, um, if you will, you know, a, a, a kind of, um, quasi natural economic domination, right? We are, instilled with fear we are indoctrinated right we we live under threat of cancellation uh you know the state does eliminate its enemies um you know the state will eliminate its enemies enemies even amongst the capitalists right um right Uh, we do live under a statified capitalism in the 21st century uh, that is suffused with authoritarian power. And, you know, and in a sense, uh, the, the instinct to obedience is, is indistinguishable from the, uh, indistinguishable from what we consider maturity. Right. You know, I mean, I'm not a parent, but, you know, if you are a parent, you you are you are socializing a child uh, to a world that is irrational and you are socializing a child to accept authority. Uh, That may not be rational, you know, that that may not be justified or earned. Uh, You are you are socializing a child to accept uh, the status quo, not only in social terms, uh, but in terms of an of an order of power, right? And so, you know, for all of those reasons, right? Um, you know, a kind of a. I mean, all of this is to say that uh, you know, I'm with Bakunin in his critique of the DSA, right? I'm I'm with the anarchists in the critique of just the we need to get like more workers' participation in the state. Right. Or we need, you know, socialized medicine. Right. Or we need more welfare that will socialized medicine, welfare, all of it will take the form of coercion and domination of the working class. Right. Which, by the way, I would point out to your guest, I watched that interview that you did with uh, Rene Berthier. Uh, right. When he started celebrating the French welfare state, I was like, what kind of anarchist is this? Right. Um, He's like, oh, yeah, the French government takes care of collective needs. And I'm like, yeah, right. Um, But, you know, that is, yeah, please. What I have tried to do as a father is raise my kids to be skeptical, to be critical thinkers, to not only with other people, with, with, with their own ideas as much as possible, 
to engage in their reason as often as they can, um, but also to engage their reason about when it is time to submit, but not to just, but to also, but when they're being forced to submit on grounds that are not reasonable, that they need to note it so that they can then understand who they're dealing with and, you know, live to fight another day, basically. But I feel like that was my role as a, a father. Sure. Uh, um, perhaps the role of the mother. It's going to be the most loving imposition of the reality principle we're ever going to get. <laughs> right. Is, right. From, is from our parents. Right. Yeah. And, but I think that that is a liberal approach also that that is saying, you know, I'm holding on to the idea that we ought to live in a society where reasoned discussion, working through ideas as rationally and as civilly as we can is what determines what we do. Um, and I, I feel as though to, uh, maybe I'm addressing this to Jared in a way, because this idea that knowledge is the power that is going to coerce people um, is one which uh, I think is demeaning to the, to the masses. Like the, if you are tr people who uh, are trained up to try to engage their reason, won't be coerced that way. And most of the time, the coercion is much more direct, whether it's economic coercion, you have to work to survive and you don't want to have your wage taken away, or direct violence. Um, anyway, that's just a... No, what Bakunin was saying was, wasn't that... Well, he does say some interesting things about intellectuals and their relationship with themselves and the way that the intellect is sort of a tyrannical kind of thing but in general he's he's saying that what the social democracy social democrats probably thinking more of lasalle than marx but what they want to do is monopolize he hates them both huh? he, he hates them both yeah he makes yeah. very little distinction yeah and it's yeah when he's pointing out like who he's criticizing when he's talking about the uh the uh, what does he call them? The um, doctrinaire socialists or whatever. It, it the finger can go in any direction. <laughs> sometimes um, it could go to the people who founded uh, the Volkstadt magazine or journal or whatever. That was the journal of the uh, social democrats. Or it could go at Marx. It could go at uh, any you know. Anyway. Uh, you were saying his critique of the intellectuals. Yeah, but he's basically a, he wants popular education to continue, but he doesn't want a even a meritocracy based on uh, um, demonstrating knowledge because he 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 has this whole thing where he'll say like it may begin as a legitimate meritocracy where the masses select who the person who really is, you know, the best of them to uh, have power. But, you know, the next round and then the round after that, this will start becoming a class of some sort in itself, distinct from the masses who will hog all the knowledge and keep the masses stupid in order so they could retain their own power. That's more so the critique. He, he thinks that, uh, you'll have gatekeepers of knowledge. And the activity of the working class in the 19th century uh, was, was very much geared towards um, popular education. Um, right. So in, in a lot of socialists, we forget uh, resisted the development of state sponsored education. Uh, because they were generating their own educational institutions. Uh, you see these things, uh, you know, so, so public libraries, so-called mechanics institutes, uh, et cetera, right? They're, they're, they, would, um, they would either, uh, as autodidact workers, uh, teach 
other workers or they would draw upon the socialist sympathetic intelligentsia uh, to give public lectures and and the like um, right this was just one example of the many forms of of, of the self-organization of the working class uh, that were, were taking place in the 19th century. They weren't being conjured into being by Proudhon or by Bakunin or by Marx or by anybody, right? They were they were developing as part of the socialist workers' movement in the broadest sense. Um, you know, there were uh, consumer cooperatives, uh, attempts at, of course, producer cooperatives coming out of the Yellenite tradition. Um, there were... Um, you know, mutual aid societies, uh, you know, to help people if, uh, you know, to, to, to bury the dead, for instance. Uh, those are ancient forms, actually, of, of, of working class uh, solidarity that go back to, uh, you know, pre-bourgeois society. You, you see things like that in the Roman Empire. Um, you know, things like Christianity are, are not unlike that, uh, you know, ancient Christianity. Um so it's a so so the socialists look at things like that, and they view them as extensions of the people's natural sociability, um, right? They uh, they or or their um, their associational life, just you know, drinking in a pub or, or or things that we might be more familiar with, the kind of desiccated uh, forms of sociability that that still exist. Uh, in our society, so, you know, but but the li- the social life of the union hall, um, you know, these sorts of things are 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 what the anarchists point to as the alternative to producing political parties, right? That take part in at least the political realm of capitalism, even if they're not administering it, right? Um, Marxism doesn't agree with that, and we should talk about why, um, right? It, you know, for, for Marxists, uh, there, there has to be an engagement with democracy, Right as Marx puts it in the Communist Manifesto, we have to win the battle of democracy. Right, and he sees democracy as the uh, political expression of capitalism. But he also, and this is you know, I think where the you know the fundamental issue is. Um, he, he also sees, you know, not, you know, of course, Marxists don't just want, or revolutionary Marxists don't want to simply participate in the state. It may not be so clear what LaSalle is in, what LaSalle's intentions are. Um, you know, does he just want a kind of representation for the working class and, and participation within the state for the working class, a kind of recognition of the working class by Bismarck? Uh, Marxists aren't interested in that, right? And they don't want uh, to, you know, elect or be the constituency of the ruler of the state. They want to seize state power, right? And in that sense, um, they make this crazy argument that there's no direct road to socialism, right? There's no, if you will, social revolution. Uh, What there is, is the possibility of, that revolution is a term that describes a political act of taking power uh, in and through uh, the political forms developed by the working class and including parties, but not restricted to parties um, that 
you know, for instance, many many such forms were developed in history, perhaps most famously workers' councils or Soviets, um, but also political parties. Um, as the culmination of, and this is where Marxists, in a sense, take up LaSalle, what LaSalle called uh, the permanent political campaign of the working class, right? That the permanent political campaign of the working class is oriented towards the working class taking power, which means that they would take the executive power of the state, that's what a revolution would be, and that would mean asserting the, if you will, the the democratic prerogative of appointing the state, right? Something that we completely, you know, it's totally in crisis now. Uh, you know, Donald Trump's not even allowed to determine what the foreign policy of the United States is because it might contradict what the permanent uh, generals in the Pentagon think. Uh, you know, project of the dictatorship of the proletariat is the one that anarchists uh, are skeptical of, right? But what that project would mean would mean uh, that you actually replace the, uh, the, the bureaucratic and coercive apparatus of the state uh, with the working class, with members of the working class that have emerged in and through that permanent political campaign for socialism, right? That have, that have been trained as it were through years of struggle against capitalism in their unions, in their strike committees, in their participation in party life, uh, to be capable of administering society. And so for Marxists, there is the idea that the, that the, that the, project that we're debating is a political one, right? That, that socialism would have to be achieved by, as it were, the people, but we would have to create the political circumstances within which that could be possible. Um, in other words, we would have to, we, we would have to create, we have to create the circumstances where uh, the the, the, the conflict amongst workers in society, and this is where we differ, is we also have a different account of society and therefore of the necessity of the state, that the self-contradictions of society would be managed by workers themselves, by a worker-administered state that as in, you know, in and through that process of working through the self-contradiction of the law of value or, or of bourgeois right, only then would the necessity of the state fully wither away and dissolve, right? And it's that transitional character, right? That kind of that notion of a political revolution initiating an era of transition to socialism, right? But, you know, of course, temporally, but also making it politically possible that the that to my mind, the real difference between uh, anarchism and Marxism lies. You said earlier that Marxists didn't believe that the self-organization of society through, you know, what came to mind for me when you were describing it would be like cafe culture, you know, clubs, sure. th that kind of thing. Um, where free people freely associate in this, you know, in a, in a happy go lucky way that, that, um, that form of self-organization could not challenge the state adequately, that that couldn't be the basis for overcoming politics. Which Even if you try to do it on a class basis, which is what the anarchists would do, right? right. They, they would do that in terms of like working class society. Right. It's not a matter of the wrong right. people. Working class cafes, working class libraries, working class dance halls. Right. So there right. would be a class line. Right. Yeah. That's but it's it. not a matter of the of the wrong people with the wrong ideas, maybe being being included or not. It, it was a matter of uh, of of something about uh, society itself, including those cafes and the clubs and everything else that was in 
I, I hate to fall into jargon in a way, but that was in contradiction to itself, that there was something about the workers themselves and their way of life that uh, had to be overcome and could not be overcome directly within society. Is that you'd actually have to use the state that developed out of it in order to overcome the contradiction in society. Is that right? Right. And the state is used now to manage that contradiction. Yeah, but not to overcome it. Not to overcome it. Right. Right. The wor workers the problem. Right. The workers will have it by the, reproducing it. Yeah. The dictators are going to come in. The dictatorship of the proletariat are going to come in, and they're not going to merely manage the contradictions in civil society, but they're going to overcome it because they will be society taking up the state for its own purpose. Is that basically correct? They'll not just be society taking up the state for its own purpose, but they will be the self-consciousness of the crisis of society, right? It, they would be the proletarianized working class, which is to say the working class self-conscious of its own self-disintegration, of its own crisis, of its own subjection to self-contradiction, to its self-contradictory status, right? A, right? a worker in capitalism is under permanent threat of cancellation, right? Is a, under permanent threat of, you know, both, both politically and socially, right? Under permanent threat of unemployment, in other, an under permanent threat of, you know, becoming an undesirable, right? Um, we all are, right? We know that, right? We know if we want to get a job, like we, we need to lurk, lurk, look a certain way. We need to have a certain kind of haircut. We, we don't need to like be carrying on about our ideas in front of the boss, right? We know that we have to adopt, you know, uh, you know, terms of, of deference, even to irrationally constituted authority. Right. Um, that's, that's the proletarian condition. Right. And so for Marxists, Marxists agree that democracy is the perfection of the state. Right. And that's something that people have a really hard time swallowing. Right. Like that, that's something that, you know, you, you have to sort of put your, um, you know, what I would call the, the kind of in liberal is liberal inheritance. Uh, but, you know, you can learn it well from anarchists, um, it, which is you know, a deep distrust of the, the will of the people. Right. Uh, in the form of democracy, right? In, in the form of this gargantuan monstrosity that we live under, right? With all of its nuclear warheads and its, you know, in the armed occupation of every city by tens of thousands of armed men, right? Like this is an outrage. This is an, this would be an outrage to the founding fathers, right? They couldn't imagine it. Right? They couldn't deal with like whatever a couple hundred redcoats quartered in Boston. Right now, there's like whatever 10,000, 15,000 permanent armed occupants of the city of Boston called the Boston Police Department. Right. It's, it's right. The, the, that's what I mean by the statification of society. Literally, you know, Marx describes it as like clogging up the pores of society. Right, even as society calls it forth, so this this self contradiction that you're describing, uh, Doug, is is the it 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 generates the pro it is the proletarian condition, and the political expression of the proletarian condition is because we all exist under threat of cancellation, we all we not only feel the threat of the state, we all demand to be saved by the state. Right. And that demand to be saved by the state is expressed through universal suffrage democracy. Right. I participate in the state. Right. Universal suffrage democracy is in that sense a, a the the highest expression, right? The Democratic Republic, Marx and Engels say, are the is the highest expression of the Bonapartist state or the capitalist state. 
right? It's a pure expression of the self-alienation of society um, in, in that sense. I want to return a little bit to this, this uh, knowledge problem. You know, when we talk mm-hmm. about vanguards or we talk about, I'm not, you know, I find it very difficult to understand the why some Marxists have a different orientation towards when we say state power, I'm thinking a coup d'etat or getting elected instead of building. But then there's Marxists who are more so thinking of building an alternative state, a dual power. And then there's consul communists. So I have a hard time understanding the, what exactly the nature of the state is in their, from a Marxist perspective, where that term continues to be appropriate in all those different circumstances. Because for an anarchist, the consul communist or Soviet democracy vision is pretty much, it's a little different, but it's basically what a lot of anarchists were advocating for. And uh, we're opposed to, you know, the Bolsheviks directing the Soviets, but we're fine with the Soviets themselves. So the workers' councils having a uh, a role outside of the the union, right, as a coordinating body. Um. So, but anyway, to return to the knowledge issue that I think is at the it, it, heart it's hard of the to fend theme. off like the whole question of the Bolshevik Revolution, but let's try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, especially because it's so often used retroactively to kind of credit Bakunin with maybe some undue foresight. Uh, Indeed. But um, the way that... Wait, Bakunin, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I can't. Why would you say it's undue? Well, Jared. because you get into this, I don't think Bakunin said that because of... Uh, Con, like the breakdown of internationalism, you would get uh, a more authoritarian Soviet system, right? Uh, the critique is more so that Bakunin's critique would be more like because you're training up uh, specialists in revolution, those people that you train to become those specialists are going to be habitually commanding and domineering people and and that'll become institutionalized and that that institutionalization of domination is the problem but he i don't think he looks at it as coming from the outside the response to reactionaries or something like that i mean i just think that they're more adequate you know we we might just if there's a if there's a anarchist critique of the Bolshevik revolution, the one that's made by the anarchists at the time is better than Bakunin's. Uh, B- Bakunin, like Bolin or... I mean, Bakunin isn't even like really like endorsing like trade unionism, you know, much less like participation in Soviets. Like there's a whole further evolution of anarchism, right? Yes. In, into, into, you know, Anarcho syndicalism in the 20th century that you know, Bakunin's not there. Um, I, I would just say that um, you know this on this issue of like intellectuals and you know the intelligentsia, scientists. Um, I I I would let's leave aside like science and and so forth. I mean, there is a question of. I mean, I'll just say from a Marxist perspective, there is the question of how the what Marx calls the general social intellect becomes an attribute of capital, right? That you only can participate in it in and through reconstituting the self-domination of society, right? Uh, and the critique of of science and technology under capitalism would would begin there. But I think that you know, there's a different question that you're raising, Jared, which is you know, that of the intelligentsia. Yeah. The socialist intelligentsia. Um, right. right. And that's this sort of new 19th century phenomenon, right? It's like 
this is not like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right? I mean, we, we think of Rousseau as one of these because he's kind of got long hair or something, right? He's a little bit uh, idiosyncratic. Uh, but really the idea of like the disaffected intelligentsia, you know, as it were, uh, smoking in the cafes of Paris and talking revolution uh, and, and art, um, that is a 19th century phenomenon, uh, and it's really a phenomenon that begins you know, with Marx and Bakunin's generation, um, you know, of, of, of like the 1840s. Um, you know, that's where you really, you know, the, the young Hegelians are really participating in that, right? It's, it's Marx's milieu. Um, and there's a question, and, 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 and there are, in a sense, all socialists uh, in one way or another. Um, and so I would say that you, like if you drill down a little bit with Bakunin, he isn't really against the intelligentsia, right? Um, and this is where the debates of the first international emerge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the accusation that Marx will make is that Bakunin is organizing intellectuals clandestinely, right? And forming secret organizations within the first international and that are not democratically responsible, the critique that, of course, uh, Bakunin makes is that the democracy within the First International is creating a despotism of its general council, which Marx has great influence within. Um, what I would point to is the fact that um, both of these thinkers have to deal with this problem. Yeah. Right. They're, they're both dealing with this question for Marx, the, you know, and I would say it's only very incipient. It, this takes on a much deeper development in the mass social democratic parties of the second international, right. Which are understood as a fusion or what Karl Kautsky calls a merger of the socialist intelligentsia and the working class and the organized working class. And the idea is that in, you know, but I think it's there in Marx, um, especially as worked through in the first international, um, that the intelligentsia can be a proletarian intelligentsia. Right, just as the working class can develop as intellectuals in and through their subordination to the party. Right, it's as party comrades that that distinction is dissolved. Right, so that the products of the intelligentsia are only worthwhile to the extent that they're serving the cause of the working class. And the, uh, the working classes development of intellectuals is no different than the middle classes insofar as they can do the same thing intellectually. And there's a, certainly a recognition that uh, the socialist workers movement requires intellectuals. Now, I would say that Bakunin is less honest about this, um, you know, and that's the Marxist critique that we could go into, uh, you know, but I would say, like, I, I very, you know, I kind of signaled this a little bit, like his, like, supposed faith, his supposed democratic faith in, like, the peasants and the semi-criminal elements and the lumpen elements, and he likes Spain and Italy and the Slavic countries better than he likes England and France and Germany. 
right? He likes the underdeveloped countries, right? He likes the wild sort of um, elemental force of the people, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't like the educated, literate, organized proletariat right with their sort of caps and uniforms in England um you know in their pub life and their their union halls uh i think that that um you know the flip side of that is that the intellectuals are going to guide the sort of unthinking masses that the intellectuals are going to do all the thinking for them you know, it's a kind of a heart and head distinction uh, that's never overcome uh, in Bakunin. And this is why Marx accuses Bakunin of being authoritarian. Yeah, it, it is something you bring the script. That is something you do have to assume a little bit by looking at Bakunin's activity, his actual practices, and then what he says. Because what he says is he takes a deterministic, naturalistic approach, and he really thinks that uh, it's going to be circumstances that immiserate the masses and uh, provide that sort of elemental energy, as, as you're saying. But in addition to that, you need to also have this universal ideal, this hope. And it's the hope that transforms the, the sort of elemental um, passions or whatever into a proper social revolution. Uh, and I think, you know, kind of like Necheyev, but not really. I, I do think Bakunin's a little sympathetic as being more like a hope provider than a... Uh, a coordinator of revolution. And it seems to be a motivational role more than a administrative one. Uh, he seems to think, he's you like know, the prototypical 19th century revolutionary. I mean, in some sense, he's the prototypical revolutionary. Well, it's the back right. to the land shit, right? I mean, it's all that, that kind of idea that you're going to be able to go into the, the peasant towns and give them hope and, teach them the truth of socialism and that they're going to, you know, the insurrection will be successful. And it's also just like, he just straight up, like he takes part in like multiple insurrections and oh yeah, you get these accounts of like this giant, you know, apparently very formidable, very charismatic man delivering, you know, the, these rousing revolutionary speeches, right. That, that, that drive, you know, men to great sacrifice, um, you know, in his, you know, with his sort of, you know, hair flowing in the wind, right? This is the this is the image of Bakunin, um, and you know, it's a it's a caricature because he is an intellectual and, and, and a serious one, um, but it's not the it's it's not the role of even Marx if he were like participating in a revolution, right? He would be. You know, as he was in 1848, he'd be doing it in the printer shop, right? <laughs> he'd be Doug Lane, right? Like printing his newspaper, um, right? Um, you know, he, he he he's not a speaker, right? Neither, neither Marx nor Engels are are are, are that. Uh, certainly not Marx. Um, but yeah, I think that this issue is. Um, yeah, the way I would the way I would put it is that Marxism both I mean, so you have this category of theory running around, right? So on the one hand, you know, part of what I'm saying is a repetition of the old Marxist accusation. Anarchists have no theory, right? And what is meant by that is that they have no theory of why the state exists under capitalism, right? And therefore, they don't understand why um, 
you can't abolish it at a stroke. They don't understand the necessity of the state and why that necessity, uh, you know, and that, that's why I was saying that they, they view private property and class society as kind of coming from the state, right? Rather, for Marxists, the state is finding, you know, rather than bourgeois society subordinating the state in its crisis, bourgeois society and the crisis of capitalism, bourgeois society is erecting a state, right? And a Bonaparte state, an imperial state, a capitalist state. Um, but on the other hand, there's this question of more, I would say Marxism has no theory uh, in the sense that Marx doesn't really oppose anything, right? What he's saying is, look, the working class reached out to the intellectuals. That happened, right? That happened before I was even full grown, right? The working class would just grab their priests in England, Right, the first working class intellectuals were 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 radical dissenting ministers in the uh, uh, mill districts in England. And some of them were quite radical. Some of them were quite great working class leaders, uh, in fact. Um, yeah, you know, so they came straight out of the sort of immediate institutions available to the working class at the dawn of their self-organization. They knew that they needed spokespeople. They knew that they needed to answer the newspaper. Hmm. They knew that they needed journalists. They knew that they needed someone to answer all the claims that were being made about how their problems were going to be solved, all the ways that the ruling class was claiming that their problems were going to be solved and that they should just leave it up, leave it up to their betters, right? They, they needed the capacities of the educated classes. At the same time, the educated classes were becoming gradually disaffected uh, and arguably um, even the middle-class professions were becoming capitalist in a way that uh, middle class people could feel um you know i i would say you know for instance my profession is 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 somehow awfully terribly uh nihilistic right i'm a i'm a professor and i'm supposed to like produce knowledge and yet at the heart of academia is like a clear attempt to undermine all intellect <laughs> and all knowledge, right? Kind of in and through itself, in and through its own specialization, right? And, and I think that's an old uh, experience, all right? I, I think that, for instance, Marx and Bakunin experienced uh, that you can't quite be a philosopher like Kant and Hegel were. Right, I mean, I think the whole young Hegelians experienced that. Um, and so you get this intelligentsia, and and so there's this this question of of merger that happened before Marx came along, right? And and I would say that the uh, impulse to political parties uh, is one that Marx, yes, affirms, but he. Because that's what pisses Bakunin off about the Hague Congress in 1872, as Marx says, right? Marx and Engels get resolutions passed saying we need to develop working class parties throughout the developed world, right? That's, from a Marxist perspective, the legacy of the First International, right? I mean, there's ultimately an, a deep legacy of the First International in terms of a conception of social and political action, uh, ultimately Marxism or you know, social democracy as, as it comes to be is, is rooted in the history of the First International. But I would say that Marx is pushing or affirming what's happening. He's not calling it into being, right? I would say that Marx and Engels, they don't call anything into being. They just criticize it. 
right? They didn't, they're not calling for socialism. They're not calling for communism. They're not calling for democracy. They have a critique of socialism. They have a critique of communism. They have a critique of democracy, right? As opposed to Bakunin is just like recoiling at mass parties, right? And then the question becomes, well, aren't the workers going to participate in this whole like dog and pony show of the, the Republicans and the Democrats, right? Like, can you really leave that realm entirely to them? Right. Because now of course we don't have working class parties, but yeah, you know, we live in the right. room, you know, but that's I, the question. I want to give Jared a, res- a chance to respond, but I, can't help but ask a question that popped up when you were talking, um, Spencer, and I don't know what your answer is going to be. But um, you said that as a university professor, you are supposed to produce knowledge, but at the same time, at the heart of the university, uh, there's an attempt to undermine knowledge, to 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 hollow out the notion of knowledge, maybe. And then you went on to describe Marx as not creating a th- knowledge but uh, as uh c- constantly critiquing undermining uh subjecting forms of knowledge to negativity would you say that the university uh as a institution that undermines knowledge is marxist in that same sense um, no i didn't i didn't mean it like that i, I meant that you know, for instance I would say that like Mm anti-intellectualism operates through scholarship, right? It's not like something insidious or not. It's not coming from like the administration or something like that. It's Mm -hmm. coming through things like specialization, right? Um, It's, you know, I mean, basically I'm just borrowing Lukacs' argument about reification, right? Mm -hmm. Where Where he's talking about like the reification of the, of the professions. And he, you know, he gives example, he doesn't give the example of academia. He gives the example of journalism. Mm -hmm. And I would say like, if you tell the truth of the story of what's happening in society, you end up, so to speak, affirming it, right? Like the search for the story, right? So, you know, what happened at OJ Simpson's house? Right. Let's get the scoop or, you know, what really happened in that hotel room, right. With Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump, like, let's go, you know, let's go find out, right. Is there a, you know, do they, is there, does the hotel have a registration record? You know, was Donald Trump at that hotel that night? Let's, let's go beat the pavement. You know, let's do some, you know, what do they call it? Shoe leather journalism, mm-hmm. um, you know, or, Let's find out like the inner workings of the connection between monopoly uh, defense contractors or sweetheart bid defense contractors and the state bureaucracy, right? And they're great journalists who do these things, right? We need them. Um, but are they criticizing society? Right? Exactly. Right. Can you get there? Right. It, you know, can I get to the point? Like, w- would it be worthwhile for me to educate my students in what I specialize in? Like it, it's crazy. It would be crazy. Right. But at the same time, you want to instill a sense of like, there's always more to know. This is how you do research. This is what scholarship is. Somehow in capitalism, I would put it to you this way. Somehow the journalists doing their job and the scholars doing their job and the lawyers doing their job, it somehow doesn't add up to public reason. Right? And that's what I mean by like capitalism expressed at the level of like intellectual production, mm-hmm. right? Um, that it 
it seems to reproduce an irrational social order or to replicate an irrational social order, right? This is the sort of thing that, you know, people, you know, people have been aware of for a while, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, it's, what Lukacs is doing is basically taking like Weber's concept of like everything is rational, right? Scholarship is totally rational. Journalism is totally rational. And at the heart of all this rationality is nihilism. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's grounding it in, in, in Marx's account of commodity form, uh, self-contradictory society. But I, I would, in other words, we'd have to give some account. That's a, a thumbnail attempt to give an account of where does the Bohemian intelligentsia come from. Mm-hmm. Well, so I think that's. I think this is a kind of a good place to go. I mean, what do, if we were to have Bakunin today, or we were to have Marx today? Uh, I'll just use our country as an example. I. I feel like they would look around and they wouldn't say any, anything like what they said in the past because of how little there is to work from as far as these uh, workers associations and friendly societies and things like that. The context just seems so different that getting the lessons out of, uh, and me and you were talking about this before we even decided to ta- mm. uh, do this topic together, Spencer. Mm. But yeah, trying to trying to get those lessons into the context of today seems, if not really difficult to do, then uh, just takes extreme uh, creativity to to come up with a way to apply them. And I think this is where both Marxists and anarchists today are missing a lot of the uh the context that's important um and kind of putting the cart before the horse where you know if we take you know whatever the student encampments for pal- pro palestinian stuff happening on campus or whatever you'll have marxists and anarchists fighting on twitter about you know who is uh you know about this stupid thing with whether or not people should have sex and use drugs at the encampment or whatever. And coming from like a, as if either. I'm glad I'm not on any, Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm or you, you just, in a lot of the, in the social movements I've experienced, you don't, you, you're not dealing with like these giant bodies of associated people who are already organized. You're dealing with a lot of, disorganized people and small little group hustles of intellectuals or the intelligentsia that spar with each other kind of uh, in front of the audience of the rest of the participants. And so to when I read Bakunin or Marx, I feel like both of them would kind of say the same thing about the situation right now. There needs to be organization at the very least you know whatever the role of the intelligentsia might be within that we could talk about but yeah i mean what i guess what are your thoughts on you know all of how to deal with this question in the contemporary sense i mean i think that um Everybody knows. I, I mean, I think everybody knows, and I think you're right. I mean, uh, everybody knows who cares to think about it um, on the left that we don't have uh, any uh, – I mean, really, there isn't anything on the left except, you know, you know, Adolf Reed says, you know, there isn't a left, they're just leftists, um, which is to say there's a there's a bunch of disaffected – Bo, you know, sort of sub bohemian sub intellectuals, um, you know, like myself, um, and we don't have uh, you. Know, in that sense, I, I, I guess I just take your your question this way, Jared. Uh, we would have to reconstitute the conditions of possibility 
for figures like Marx and Bakunin, right? They couldn't, yeah. um, you know, they wouldn't be able to breathe here um, because um, both of them took for granted uh, that there was this vast and growing working class movement. And, you know, it's, it, and the, its defeats didn't phase them at all. You know, so you, it's hard for us to put our, you know, to think it through, but um, I think Bakunin was just imprisoned um, in, in the 1850s. You know, Marx was staving off starvation, um, you know, trying to, you know, get paid uh, for, for writing newspaper articles, trying to find newspapers somewhere in the world that would take his stuff, uh, managed to find um, some editors in New York who would underpay him uh, for articles and, you know, God help us occasionally take the only copy of that it existed on earth and throw it in the dustbin and not print it or pay him. And we, we don't even have it anymore. Um, but, in other words, they experienced the defeat of 1848. They experienced, you know, a, a, a staggering, resounding defeat of the working class um, that, you know, took the form of you know, the June Days Massacre and you know, eventually the collapse of, of the revolution and of the Second Republic in France and, and, and of the hopes across Europe and on the ruins of which was erected a new... Um, imperialist despotism, you know, that of, of Louis Bonaparte, they were never phased. They thought, well, this socialist workers movement is rising, right? That's what they thought. Like, it, it, it's down now, but it's rising, right? They, they never thought, like, this thing's over, mm -hmm. right? right? They thought, this is coming back. They can't stop it. Right. And of course, they were right. They were not wrong about that. They were right about that. There was a growing socialist workers movement. It did rise from the ashes at the end of the 1850s. There was a titanic struggle for the rights of labor in the United States that overthrew slavery and inspired the world and gave created the conditions for a revolutionary decade in the 1860s that ultimately culminated in the formation of the first international which was in part a you know union solidarity enterprise in Europe right. you know, a Lincoln in the union solidarity enterprise um, you know amongst primarily French and English workers and of course culminating in the working class seizing power and administering society in the city in the city of Paris uh, for three months uh, in in the Paris Commune um, as revolution ricocheted around the world and franchise was expanded and democracy was expanded and and radical reconstruction was conducted in America and revolution took place in Spain it on and on and on you know, the achievement of uh, Italian unification. These were revolutionary times in which these people are sparring, right, with each other, right? We live in a time where society is, you know, I, I think you, did you say, like, it's, like, it's hard to, it's, like, it's hard to convince people that it exists. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um Right. And, 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 and people can't imagine, the, you know, their freedom, even at an individual level. Right? They, they, they don't even imagine their, in, their own individuality. Right. If you if you ask them to give an account of themselves, they'll they'll talk about their I don't know what their height, their weight, their skin color, you know, their race, their privileged status their something or other. Right. Maybe if, their accomplishments. Maybe, you know, you know. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Yeah. Right. Let's, yeah. let's, let's think about what we can make of ourselves. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, rather than what's given. But yeah, there's even a biologization of gender now. Uh, right. Um, you know, kind of a rebiologization of gender. Right. You're not 
you know, you're not really gay. You're just born in the wrong body. Well, we got medical, you know, treatment that can fix that. That can that can medically realign you with nature, um, right? And I'm not against you know any of that. I'm just saying there's an ideological dimension to that, mm-hmm. right? Um, so we have great difficulty thinking about you know our our friendships, our marriages, our, our you know, individual lives, much less like building associational forms, right? I mean, w- what I would say about it is like, we don't need unions aligned to the Democratic Party. We don't need an American Civil Liberties Union aligned to the Democratic, I mean, to get to your point about free speech and so forth, Doug, like we need to, pr- we would pry these things away from capitalist politics. Like there's, there's a, you know, we could speak concretely about how society's been confiscated, right? Mm-hmm. Labor unions have been confiscated, have been claimed by capitalist politics, right? Socialist institutions like the American Civil Liberties Unions have been claimed by capitalist politics, have been wrested away from society and coordinated with the state, right? So we would have to struggle for that class independence, right? That 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 question of of working class organization is a question as we were you know, beginning to suggest before of independence from the state, right? The class mm-hmm. line is the state line, right? Like you, you know, the old, the old issue was if you work for the police, if you're in the military or you're in the police, you're not in the socialist movement, mm-hmm. right? If you're a part of the executive structure of power, you are not in the socialist movement. Right. No socialist politician can be president of capital states. Right. You can't be a minister. You can't hold a portfolio in the parliamentary system. Right. You can't be the minister of defense or the minister of labor or of health or anything. You can't administer capitalism if you're a socialist. Right. That was the class line. And. You know, we have no conception of that, and our politics is actively undermining. That's why I was saying, you know, the, I'll take Bakunin over the DSA. I think that's a good a good way to actually to summarize it is taking Bakunin over the DSA because, as, as a Marxist perspective, even not as a necessarily an anarchist one. Of course, anarchists are going to say that, but my impression is not that Marx would uh, would advocate for something like. Uh, the the DSA or um, what I see as mostly a uh, you put it well, so I'm not going to repeat it. That the the distinction, the class distinction, has not be is no longer an organizational uh, chasm, uh, and we have these organizations that are class collaborationist. And I think even a Marxist would want that class line to be maintained first. And then whatever they do next, you know, that's going to be the argument with the anarchists, but that's the agreement. I mean, as a member of Platypus, I I would say that, um, you know, I think that the crisis in society is also a crisis of leftist ideology. Um, you know that 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 you know, and that's why I you know I, I just won't sort of uphold Marxism. I mean, I we have to say, you know, and I I would humbly suggest that anarchism is is pretty degraded too. Uh, but but Marxism is is certainly right, utterly besmirched, tattered. The red flag lies in the mud, right? Uh, in in the mud of of you know, a century of what is in part describable as statism, um, and I think that. You know, it's it's a you know it's like people talk about it all the time. Like you know, do you live in a communist country? It's like, what are you talking about? Right? There's no such thing, right? Um, I mean, we could talk about the workers taking power in certain countries, right? 
obviously, uh, if they if workers were to take power, it would happen in one place before it would happen in every place. Um, but that's not the same thing as talking about a government as socialist, right? So I would say that there's all sorts of ways in which um, – as intellectuals, like there's an intellectual task, I would say. I mean, yes, there's a task of like organizing in, in society. And, and and I just, you know, I guess the honest answer to your question about that, Jared, would be, I, I don't know anything. Like I've never, I've never organized anything, right? I know that people have organized stuff, right? Like this is the kind of thing that we want to learn from like the people who organized like the civil rights movement before they die. Like there, there are people who used to really know how to organize in society and like not many people in my generation and not many young people like have that kind of experience. Um, You know, even just people, you know, the, the boomers rebuilt the labor movement, you know, for better or for worse. They rebuilt it ultimately as a constituency for the Democrats. But, you know, if you go and you meet all these, you know, labor uh, officials, right, they're all like 70s vintage Maoists and whatever, right? They were radicals, right? They were 60s, 70s radicals. Um, they learned how to do things. Uh, I, I don't know how to how to do things like that. And and I, I live a very isolated, atomized life. Right. If if it weren't for, you know, talking to my buddy Chris on the phone and if it weren't for, you know, chatting with my wife, it would be total loneliness, right? Except for like talking to nineteen year olds three times a week. Um, right. So I, I live in a very desiccated society. I live a very desiccated social existence. Um, but I would say that intellectually, we have to recover the memory of what socialism was. You know, yeah. Can, can I, I want to, I want to just make a right comment the- on, on that. Um, then uh, Jared, I, I can't help myself, but not only do we have to recover the memory of what socialism was in the 19th century, say, <clears throat> right now we're faced, I think, with recovering the memory of what the DSA was and what Jackman was. Um, because, um, you know, right. Jacobin and, and that whole approach to trying to get Bernie Sanders elected and all of that, that had a theory behind it, which was maybe wrongheaded, but it had a theory that had to do with society. Um, the guy, the idea was we'll get Bernie Sanders in and he'll basically take some of the pressure off of the working class and give them the ability to self-organize again. That was their, that was their whole uh, purpose. Or right? some of them thought, you know, we'll just use the campaign as a kind of an organizing right. you know, project, right? They didn't even think of like the getting Sanders elected was right. the goal right they, there were different ideas uh, yeah. i would say that they that there was never really an, a clear and open debate about any of that and it was all a kind of a, a a debased repetition of the old dsa strategy of reorientation from the 60s mm-hmm. right there was a project of reconstituting socialism at the heart of the civil rights movement mm-hmm. and nobody remembers that <laughs> right, they just think it's like a uh, you know, civil rights act, voting rights act, done and dusted. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, actually, society's still racist, so we have to have black power and black nationalism. Like that is the stupid capitalist narrative of that. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So right now, I think we're in a moment where this idea of socialism and along with it, society is. Uh-huh. Kind of disappearing. I mean, there's a meme of the Joker saying, "We live in a society, like it's uh, and, and and it's like inscrutable." Uh, to to me, actually, as a meme, but also I think to people, it's just like a weird, it's like a like like uh, I guess the meme means that society is some horrible uh, Im- imposition upon people. I'm not sure what it meant when Joker said it. What do you think, Jared? 
I don't I don't know the Joker meme, but I you know as far as society disappearing, I, I mean, what might be called the social or like mass society that you find in a shopping mall or you find in a public square, or public public parks where people are doing stuff that might be disintegrating. But as far as the way that it's embodied within objects or like in a real materialist sense, it's not disappearing. We still very much are uh, tied up with a society, a mass mass production society. <clears throat> and it's hard to think about material autonomy or anything like even like in a subsistence farming kind of way, uh, which would be kind of a pre-social uh, civilizational form, right? So society is becoming atomized and uh, personalistic, right? It's uh, marketing is no longer about appealing to the masses. It's about appealing to different consumer categories, right? But those are subdivisions of of a mass society. They're not um the consumer not, not ain't, ain't what it used to be either. Right. Remember when Amazon was good, right? It would be like people who like this also like that. And I was like, I also like that. Right. <laughs> Like it was yeah. so smart and it's like gotten worse now. And like, everything's like a sponsored link. You're like, no, that sucks. I'm not going to read that. I'm not going to read that. Like, what are you talking about? Like it used to be like, you know, I don't know what, like if you like Karl Marx, you might like Gare Glukach. <laughs> yeah. They like, <laughs> uh, like they traded out the, like, oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. I'll buy now. Um, now really the advertisers became like, you got slotted into different advertisers instead of slotted into different like consumer groups <laughs> is kind of mm -hmm. what happened. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't fully understand it, but you know, obviously like I, I think the young people like have, it's, it's very primal now, right? Because you know, they went through COVID and, and so they have a very kind of um, concrete, perhaps sort of overly concrete image of social isolation, right? Which is like literally being like locked in front of a computer screen when they're like very young and, uh, you know, desperately in need of, of, you know, time with their peers. Um, and so like, there's like a fetish of like IRL interaction, right? Um, which is obviously like super degraded, but you know, healthy, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of sadly primitive, <laughs> like, yes, let's like see each other. And I don't know what, you know, sort of pet each other, uh, in, <laughs> in, in real yeah. life. Um, you know, I, I don't know what exactly we're supposed to do in real life. You know, maybe, maybe we can like headbutt like Rams or something. Well, we're all, we're all middle-aged, right? We're all, I'm, we're, Spencer and I are older than Jared's you. Are. I'm about to cross into that. I got a couple of years till I'm 40. But okay, okay. I thought you were 40 yeah, yeah. already. You told maybe. But okay, so you're coming. You know, depending on how long you live, you're around middle age. And yeah. um, <clears throat> that was so, old enough to be your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, here's the point I was getting to. Not the point was not how old I am. Um, although partly, I, I when I was young, when I was in you know my early 20s i lived in downtown portland hmm. there was a, a cafe within walking dis easy walking distance of my studio apartment it was right off of the portland state university campus there was not just one there were a whole bunch of these little places but there was one i would frequent it was not dominated by students despite the fact that it was right there by portland state it was dominated by a mix of people in this neighborhood, which was not high rent, but well, you know, it was kind of a right. working class neighborhood, maybe service industry, um, mailmen, people like that. <clears throat> we go, I go in, I met people through the cafe. I played chess with people, debated philosophy, 
talked about, started a zine, all of these things out of this little cafe, which I didn't, which was not put there by some party or didn't have a political orientation. This cafe it just existed, and it was, um, I think, fairly common experience for people in the Pacific. It was Northwest. somebody's private property. Yeah, it was someone's private property. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it was Mohammed's private property. Um, he he was a an immigrant who started a cafe, um, and in any case, it was a common occurrence that, that there was a kind of a cafe culture, a resurgence of it, maybe in the early nineties. I'm not sure, or if it was. I, I, I thought of, I, if I thought of it that way because I was young and didn't participate in in it in the night in the eighties or seventies. But anyway, I wonder if that kind of experience is still. It was. It was also the decade of Starbucks, right? <clears throat> yes, it was. But Starbucks, um, Starbucks may have created an interest in that kind of. You know, like Blockbuster came up, but then there are also these little video stores. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, 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 you know, I, yeah, both. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, I just wonder if that is still an experience that people who are young have that kind of living in an urban area, not too high a rent, and some rundown studio apartment uh, going to. Well, <clears throat> you know, gentrification I think has had a pretty big impact on that in the mm -hmm. you know the places like. Even where I am, Central Phoenix, it's pretty expensive to live there. And I had the, in the early 2000s, exactly what you said. It was Counterculture Cafe was the name of it. Mm -hmm. It was a 24-hour coffee shop. It was the hub of the uh, the bohemian poets and performance artists and radicals. The anarchists had a library there. And... Mm -hmm. It was absolutely a, a coffee shop. It had rooms. You sat in cozy chairs in and did your thing. And then there was a stage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it's possible for a place like that to exist where it does now or where it did now mm -hmm. uh, because of the rent. The rent itself to even run that business is so high that what you would have to make that business work is unthinkable like no one's going to pay that much for coffee or a bag of tea or something like that especially not the same type of people that were filling it before you know under 21 or but also staying up till 4 a.m <laughs> so what about the info shops i mean if, are they still around you know what i'm talking about they're touch and go uh, you know the ones that are really established like uh in uh, San Francisco is still around. Um, Long Hall in Berkeley is still around, but they, I mean, it depends on what your relationship is to the landlord and what the city, you know, how it protects uh, your rents or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you're living anywhere where the rents are just going up all the time because of development, then having an info shop in that kind of a location is not really possible. And there's no one interested that's living there. It's a bunch of uh, um, whatever tech tech workers, real estate agents. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, if if you indulge indulge me, I mean, I'm just going to mm -hmm. point out that you know this is a classical liberal preoccupation, right? The coffee shop, um, mm -hmm. right? Where did essays come from, right? Addison and Steele would sit in the coffee shop in, you know, 17 zeros London, and they would listen to the debate or can be in a debate, and then they would write it out, and there was a dialectic in the essay, right? Mm -hmm. And they would publish it, Addison and Steele's essays, and then they would circulate them to all the coffee shops, Right, and then those would be read the next day, and then there would be further debate, and there would be more essays. Right, and the idea of the coffee shop was that you you didn't know, right? So I would say that you know, to the extent that it exists, you know, maybe it's on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the the thing was is that you don't know the person in the coffee shop, so you call them Mister. Right, you just everyone must be a gentleman. <laughs> Right. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, maybe they're a lord, 
but they don't mm -hmm. require their title since you don't know. And, and so you could be talking, uh, you know, to Lord Macclesfield, but he's not identified and his, you know, his retainers aren't there. He's just there reading a pamphlet or a newspaper, right? The new in the coffee shops all had the pamphlets of the day and the newspapers of the day, and that's what attracted people to come to them, right? And the idea was was that the conversation over coffee, there was no respect. You know, we were no respecters of persons, right? We didn't know what the status of anybody was in London in the coffee shop. It was a concentration of the anonymity of bourgeois society and thus of bourgeois reason. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why, you know, the, you know, there's a wonderful section. Sorry, I'll be a little geeky. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Enlightenment classic, uh, the uh, philosophical history of the European settlements in the East and West Indies, the bestseller of the Enlightenment uh, by the yeah. Abbe Reynaud, in which he describes the 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 travel of coffee from Saudi Arabia to England as like a coming revolution and the Asiatic despots are like stamping out the coffee shops because the coffee is making people too sober and too reasonable, right? And and you drink coffee and you start talking and London is the center of the revolution because it has so many coffee shops. Of course, this is an yeah. Anglophilic uh, Frenchman writing this text, uh, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it, these are like classic, you know, issues of, of, of public reason and it, it, of course, I think young people have it, right? It's just that I don't think that they have anyone to affirm them in it, right? Mm -hmm. like, right? Like, as far as I'm concerned, like, I don't care. Like, are you straight? Are you gay? Are you black? Are you white? Like, get together, whatever it takes. Have a mm -hmm. drink, you know, have a toke, whatever. Talk. <laughs> And find out what each other thinks and try out ideas and say the conservative thing or say the Democrat talking point and turn it over in all of its facets, right? And what the position that you take isn't like revealing who you are and forever will be, right? You're mm -hmm. a racist or you're a turf or you're a this or you're a, you're a libtard or you're a that, right? No, right? Allow you allow the free play of reason as part of the free play of your own potential mm -hmm. right, as a person, and I I certainly think that kids do that right. Um, mm -hmm. if, if I didn't think that, I wouldn't uh, be an educator. Um, but you know, I think that our society doesn't you know, our, our society tells kids to segregate and our society tells people to keep their mouth shut and to not express their opinions, right? I see my students talking, they, they want to talk and they want to be social. And so they talk about sports or anything, wow. you know, um, because they're terrified by society. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking for two hours. <clears throat> Should we wrap it up here, or do you want to have more to uh, say? Sure. I, yeah, I think we're we're <laughs> we've taken we've come pretty far from the original topic. <laughs> That's true. Uh, which well, you know, is fine with me. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we arrived where we needed to be. Is how I would feel about it. But maybe I'm just being nostalgic. But I. I, I feel like uh, we started about, uh, I set it up like a debate between the Marxists and the anarchists. And what we came to by the end was a kind of agreement and nostalgia for liberalism, 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 <laughs> right. Which yes. is, um, right. Which what is what we all share actually. And um, not that we're democratic party liberals, but that we share a, a love of liberal freedom. Reason, freedom. Yeah. And 
yeah, so I think that, uh, and you know, I ended up thinking about the days when I felt maybe a little more free than I do now. So seems natural. Um, that may not just be history, Doug. I I think <laughs> I'm old. I, in my case, it's it's physical. You know, I, I chastised my wife this morning because she wasn't adequately acknowledging how stiff I was in the morning. Right? She was making me bend up and do Listen, this. Don't that, make me go yeah, Freudian on you. How I stiff you were in the morning? She wasn't adequately addressing your stiffness in the morning? All right, I'm uh-huh. going to end it there. 